graduate beyond the pendulum uh, to a double pendulum. And a little bit more. Uh, <clears throat> the next sort of level of your underactuated sort of training uh, takes you to a class of systems that I, sort of an equivalence class of systems that are a handful of degrees of freedom, um, <clears throat> but they're the canonical underactuated systems. So we'll talk, we'll use as examples the Acrobat, the cart pole system, some quad rotor systems, but that's actually just a few samples of a pretty long list of sort of um, what I would call the model or the canonical underactuated systems. And this is, I'll just list a few more of them here. Um, besides those we have, there's the Feruda pendulum, which is just a little bit different. Um, Pendubot is another, you might have heard of reaction wheel pendulum. Convey crane, ball and beam. There's a bunch, okay? Hovercrafts are basically quadrotors. Um, <clears throat> these are the ones, this is like sort of the textbook examples of underactuated systems. They all have less actuators than the degrees of freedom, so they're trivially underactuated. Um, and actually, <clears throat> um, in the classical nonlinear control literature, there's a few sort of um, approaches for control that work for many of them, but they all take a little bit of their own. There's, a, there's sort of a different solution for the convey crane than for the reaction wheel than for the pendubot. And classically, when you're working with these systems um, sort of before optimization-based control, you had to think a lot about each of them in order to come up with some clever controller for each. And I'll give you a sense of that in the next lecture. But today I wanna first point our optimization tools at them and hopefully we have sort of a small set of tools that will work for many of these types of systems. Okay, the ones we'll actually um, zoom in and focus on, the Acrobat is our two-link pendulum. So it's got inertia, so it's not a simple pendulum anymore. It's got inertia in the links, okay. Theta one, theta two. And we have a torque around the elbow, but somebody forgot to give us a motor at the, at the, elbow, at the shoulder, or, or, okay. So uh, it, the reason it's called an acrobat, you can think of it a little bit like an acrobat on a high beam where you have relatively little torque to, available at your wrist compared to a, a lot of torque uh, at, your, at your waist. And so you could imagine acrobats can do dramatic things like swing up and balance on a high beam, right? Even though they have very little actuation at their wrist. And we'll ask this acrobat to do the same kind of thing. Okay, so even though you don't have any torque available here, uh, you're still able to do quite interesting things. The cart pole system, some people just call it the pendulum, but you know, we even use this uh, <clears throat> we use this in our intro controls courses, but typically we only look at the linear control at the top. In this class, we'll think about the whole nonlinear dynamics of this. Once again, we now have a, a cart on a on rails or on wheels. We're allowed to apply a force, so it's like the double integrator base here, but we have a pendulum attached to it. And because we didn't have enough research funding, nobody gave us a motor to control the, the pendulum here, so we have zero torque here, and it's trivially underactuated, okay? So these have become canonical systems, actually, uh, even for instance, if you go to the OpenAI gym, you'll see Acrobat 
and cart pole and a few other examples that are sort of, this is the reinforcement learning um, benchmark problems that people use. I think they're kind of silly versions of them, um, but there it is. So I've said it. Uh, <clears throat> You know, we have, that's, those are relatively new. We've been thinking about Acrobots for a long time. I have an Acrobot in my office, right? So this is a, um, this is a physical Acrobot that we have in the office section. And even though it doesn't have an actuator at the shoulder, it can swing up the balance at the top. Okay. So it looks, if you look carefully here, you say, okay, there is an actuator at the shoulder, but why, You'll, we'll, see that, we'll see this as we work through it, but actually this motor is controlling a torque here. If you think, we'll, it, we'll see it in the math actually, that, uh, and there's, actually, there's a lead slug at the end here with a, <laughs> a little bit of padding so you don't hit yourself in the head with a lead slug, uh, but we try very much, very hard to make this link have a lot of inertia and this link to have relatively less inertia because what matters is you'd like the inertial coupling, we'll see what that means in the nonlinear equations soon, you'd like this to be relatively heavy compared to this so that when you wave this around, you have control authority, okay? So we do a lot of work to keep the inertia of this link low, so we put a motor here and put a sh light shaft through it and there's a, um, there's a coupler there that, that turns that into a torque at the, at the elbow. It's actually a friction drive, so there's, there's no gears there because backlash is very bad. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice little mechanical design. It's like the only time that a friction drive really works out well. And there's, <clears throat> you can imagine we have wires running through here, but we wrap around a lot so there's a shaft coupler there to make sure that the wires don't wrap up. And it's a nice little um, implementation of a simple robot. Okay, so once again, even though you don't have that actuator, you can still pump up energy swing up and then balance the top. But with optimization, we'll do better too. We'll see that there are very efficient solutions that can get to the top if we really sort of nail the problem. If we own the problem, then very, very nice solutions exist. Uh, this is the cart pole. This is the physical version we have um, of the cart pole. Ignore the, I'll tell you about the rest of the algorithm first. I just want you to see the hardware in this case. So this is when the algorithm turns on, it swings up and balances. Uh, sort of the goal is to say from any initial condition, it can quickly find itself back up in the initial, at the top, okay? Now this one's actually even more interesting in the sense that it's not only a nonlinear dynamics that's under actuated, it also has these hard constraints because it's got a finite length of the track and you have to think about those when you're doing your control design because if you have a controller that expects to be able to run arbitrarily far away from the origin, then it's gonna fail. So there's collisions here that you'd like to avoid too. Okay, so those are the physical systems we'll think about first, and I'll, I'll do quadrotors, of course, at the end. You, I think you know roughly what a quadrotor is. The equations of motion for both of these are in our standard manipulator equation form. Okay, for the acrobat, Q is theta one, theta two. U is the torque at the elbow. And B takes this, tor this scalar torque at the elbow and applies it into the generalized coordinates so it does not affect theta one directly, it only affects theta two directly 
So B turns out to be the two by one matrix zero one, which is low rank. Okay, okay. so that's clearly underactuated. And then the cart pole The x position of the cart is one coordinate, and the theta position of the pole is the other coordinate. U is the force on the cart. And here, B directly affects the cart, but not directly the pole, and we get another low rank matrix. B is this. Because these things are physical systems and in practice we have limits, um, we also have, for, for the acrobat, we say that U is less than some um, U max. Okay, that's our torque limit. And for the cart pole, we have both. the input limit and if in this system at least we have our in particular Q is less than or equal to Q max. I'm sorry, let me call it X cart. Okay, so our task in both cases is, um, is to take our system, let's say it's, it's in some random initial condition, we'd like to swing up and balance it at the top, right? Yeah. Why is there gravity multiplied by torque? Oh, good. So why is this? Yeah, this is a subscript G. So this is, so you can think of gravity applying a torque. Okay, so in the equations of motion, we have F equals MA. The, th this is MA on this side, and each of these are generalized forces. So they're, it ultimately they're, they're torques in, this, in, in the case of the acrobat. So there's one torque that I call the gravity torque. I could write gravity there if that's better. That um, is the accumulation of all the gravity forces, and then uh, another one that comes from actuation. If I were to put friction or other things, I would call it tau friction. If I was going to have a, some collision, I'd put another tau collision or tau impact or other things on the, on the right-hand side. Okay, so if we want to stabilize the system at the top, then you could imagine just like the double integrator or just like our simple pendulum, we have a couple different ways to write down cost functions that we could use optimal control to, to try to stabilize the system, right? So we could say minimum time to the top. We could say quadratic regulator cost to the top, right? And we'd expect, we'd like if, if all is well, that we could take these slightly more complicated equations, turn them through the cranks that we've already developed, and get some satisfying solutions that stabilize. So I said, um, you know, last time, that so far from dynamic programming, if we have our minimum time cost or LQR cost, for instance, we have, I roughly said there's two broad approaches that work, right? The first one was we're gonna discretize everything. and then try to do value iteration. If we can discretize 
time, state actions, make a big grid, then we can just do graph search and try to solve the problem, right? And the other extreme was if we have a linear system, we showed a nice closed form solution in the linear quadratic regulator. Those were the two extremes where we had very satisfying solutions. So what do you think? Which of these is gonna help us out today? What, which of these might apply quickly to those systems? Number two, so are the systems, are the equations linear? Like right out of the box, two doesn't work because it assumes that the systems of the form x dot equals ax plus bu, right? I mean, I've already told you on my notes for the day that we're gonna try to do both of them. So they're both gonna be made to work, but both of them take a little bit of work, right? Because right now, the LQR derivation assumed that we have a linear system. This is decidedly not a linear system, okay? So we're gonna linearize those equations and see if we can understand when it's gonna work, okay? What about discretizing and, and value iteration? Already, you're gonna be doing on your homework and you're gonna see the pain of the discretization. Even on the double integrator, like the simplest one, you get, you know, painful discretization errors, right? Because you just can't make a fine enough mesh, especially when you're in these really discontinuous control policies, which are the bang bang kind of control policies. We already felt the pains of discretization of the continuous system. It turns out if you just take the naive discretization approach to the acrobat in the carpool, it just doesn't work. I mean, you, you just think, okay, I'll just, I'll use more memory, no big deal, you know. It really is very hard to make. I think if, I, don't, I won't say it cannot work. If you were to do very clever sort of variable spaced meshing, you know, you were to set up your mesh just right, interpolate carefully, I think you could make it work. But it just doesn't feel like the right solution. It's any natural simple discretization of the system. When I say it doesn't work, if you were to discretize the system, solve the value iteration policy, you actually get, value, you can get value iteration to converge and you run the controller and the robot goes, oh, well, it falls down. It doesn't actually stabilize the fixed point, okay? Just because of value, of, of discretization errors. Okay, so <coughs> there's hope, right? I want to sort of tell you about both the ways to express, ex, ex, extend both of those approaches. Although I'll do this first one pretty quickly because I, it's, a, it's potentially a bigger topic and I just want to sort of um, admit its existence without going into the full glory of, of function approximation, right? So there's a version of value iteration that still works if you don't have a simple trivial mesh, but instead you're using some sort of function approximator like a neural network, okay? So you remember our equations of, uh, our value iteration update was said that we're gonna make an estimate J of X, right? And we'd like in the discrete time case, for this to hold. Right? If we can find a solution that for this to have equality, then we could, that it's gonna be our optimal solution. In the purely discrete case, we were able to just perfectly represent this by just, a, you know, if, by enumerating J for every state, it's just a vector, okay? But in the more general case, this might be a function approximator. For instance, now let's call it a deep network or something, right? Okay, so it's some big function that has a lot of parameters 
that I'll call um, j hat, maybe it's got a bunch of parameters alpha of x. And again, I apologize for not giving a full introduction to function approximation. I put a little bit more in the notes, but really not, not so much. So much. I, it's not the focus that I want here, but just to say you could imagine writing a more general class of functions that could be polynomials with unknown coefficients. It could be um, the weights of a neural network, okay? But I, and I'd like to try to find those weights so that this equality holds. And in fact, you can do that with um, machine learning approaches where you try to make this hold using least squares optimization, okay? So you can try to say minimize alpha such that this minus this, you know, make this error min over u, g of x u, I have this whole thing squared, and I'll do it at a bunch of sample points, okay? If I pick a bunch of random samples X, or they could be on a grid or something like this, and I'd say, like to say at those sample points, I would like J, I'd like to find the alpha that makes this j as, as close as possible to this in some quadratic sense, then that becomes almost a supervised learning problem where I'm just trying to make my function approximator equal some other values. There's an important um, trick where you fix this, you pretend this is a fixed previous um, you know, solution just to avoid the extra recursion. I've written it carefully in the notes, but I just want to point out that certainly this become, can be turned into a standard um, learning problem. Yes? How do you know the optimal value or cost of the function in the graph? Good. So there's two cases I think that we know how to do fairly well. So how do I, how do I find this, for instance? This is min over u. I don't know why I wrote alpha again there. How do I solve this min over u, right? So there's two cases we talked about. One is the discrete actions where I can just try a bunch of u's and take the smallest one, okay? And the other one was continuous actions. Continuous time. and quadratic cost, we knew how to do that. And there's a few more little permutations around that, but in the, in the other, other case, there's, there's a couple cases where we can solve for this exactly, okay? Let me show you in code. Okay, here's a simple example of trying to do the double integrator. How many people have used PyTorch, right? Or, or yeah, a lot. Some, is, uh, it seems that a few people have used it a bunch, okay? So um, this is a very simple example. It's not part of your homework. It's sort of, in fact, I, I would call this a challenge. I, I will put this up tonight as, as an example, and to those of you that are experts in deep learning, I, I, will, I consider this a challenge to you. Um, it works, I think the code's correct. I find it wholly unsatisfying. If you are better at tuning neural networks than me, I, would, I think you could probably do better. I've done zero hyperparameter tuning, but, but this is perfectly good code, and I actually would be very interested to understand how well it works. So maybe I should channel Goodwill Hunting or something here. So here, here, here uh, you know, previous, uh, let's see, 
Previous winners include, uh, you know, lowly MIT professors. Uh, but here's a challenge. It's posted on GitHub, not on a blackboard in the hallway, sorry. Um, and and if, you, if you can beat my score by getting a better, uh, you know, a better reproduction of the bang bang solution for the double integrator in a deep neural network, then your name will forever be posted, not in the MIT tech, I'll, but I'll post it in the underactuated notes. Yeah? <laughs> and it's good for anybody, any, you know, online too. So, any, so uh, um, I'd be very curious to see what a little bit of hammering on the hyperparameters would, would do, okay? Um, there's a bunch of parameters in the, of like how many layers in the neural network, what's the learning rate, stuff like this. I made zero effort to tune those, but and I think you could do better. But let me show you, uh, in the case of discrete time, um, continuous state discrete actions, let me make sure I've pressed enter enough times here. Then you can have a simple um, optimization where you'd like to minimize basically the one step cost plus the next cost. Try to make J look like J desired. It's a standard um, machine learning problem for the LQR on the double integrator. It does basically the right thing, right, which is hopefully not too bad. This is a, a ReLU network. Right, it comes up with my standard expected cost to go function. It matches our double integrator solution, okay. Um, but for the bang bang solution, which is just uncommented at the top, uh, it doesn't capture the cusps very convincingly yet. The challenge is on, okay. Um, there is also another, um, I'll, put, I'll put up both versions too. The other case where we know how to solve it nicely is the continuous time, continuous state, continuous action problem where I have an explicit solution to my minimum minimizing U and I can stick that in and do value iteration on that. It's a little bit different. Um, it's all derived in the notes, okay. But you can imagine having a neural network represent J and trying to fit the parameters of the neural network to represent that, okay. And that should in principle scale. If you can do enough sample points and do enough learning, then you, you could imagine, and people do, uh, the solutions on OpenAI Gym are roughly trying to learn a, a J using this kind of approach. They use Q learning instead of value um, iteration, but, but it's, it's mostly the same as this. So there's hope for that. But I think in the cases where we know the optimal solution, Exactly, and we know it's pretty complicated landscape. It doesn't do a great job, okay, until you've tuned it better. Um, and I find it maddening to not have a more systematic solution, right? If every time I need to start up a new system, I have to play with the hyperparameters that much, then I don't feel like I've mastered the Acrobat. Okay. So that's a, a standing challenge now uh, that I will post. But let's think about what, it, what we can do with the other end of the spectrum where we have closed form solutions but only for linear systems. It turns out um, here there's really very little tuning. Uh, we have to choose our cost functions still. But if we do have A and B, then we just have to pick Q and R and we get a controller out. So that's, that's a much less tuning. If we can make the LQR solution work for the Acrobat, the cart pull, then I think we've got something interesting. Okay, so how do we do LQR um, for a nonlinear system? Are there any questions? I'm sorry I went quickly through that, but are there any questions on approximate value iteration at the level I covered it? Yes. Good. Some of you actually caught me, even in my, the code that I showed for the simple case, the double integrator, actually used the word 
um, fitted value iteration. So there was actually a little bit of, of, uh, value, of function approximation already happening even in my simplest examples. And the reason for that was that on the mesh that I made, right, I had some initial x, I had a couple different potential actions, and none of those actions happened to land exactly on another mesh point. So I was already using a little bit of function approximation just to interpolate between, this is the barycentric um, interpolation that uh, Wilco uh, pointed out on, on Piazza. Um, I was already doing a little bit of this just to interpolate what is J next, given my current solutions at all the grid points, okay? The, and that works, but still that's based on, if, you, if I've made a mesh for my function approximator, you can think of a mesh as, a, as the limit of a function approximator where I've had to sort of mesh the entire space. You can imagine using a different parameterization that doesn't require having landmarks in space that scale exponentially with the dimension of the state space, like a neural network. That's just a different representation of that same function. Why does it work better? I'm not convinced it does work better, right? But it should scale better. There's no hard dependence on the dimensionality of the state space. It's just x is some function going in, and I could put it through some deep net, okay? And my j of x is coming out, right? This is just some neural net. I think, you know, in deep learning, neural networks have worked extremely well for perception. You know, I think convolutions, for instance, are an extremely natural representation for dealing with images that has made neural networks work extremely well. Um, I don't think convolutions work well in state space. In fact, some of the representations people do, sometimes people will actually take their cart pole. In the OpenAI gym examples, for instance, people will take the cart pole they'll render a picture of it from the side and do control from the pictures instead of from the state variables because we know how to do convolutions and the like and it's cool that you can do that. I mean, that's impressive and we'll talk about it too. But I don't think we really understand what is the right representation, what's the right architecture of neural networks for functions that are of the class that we're trying to deal with in these systems which have stiff nonlinearities and the like, right? I think people are approximating, approximating them to some extent, we don't know exactly how well um, with the neural network architectures we have, but I don't think, I think in a few years we'll have different, archi different architectures and a better understanding of that. Good. Okay, so let's think about the other extreme of trying to use linear control for a nonlinear system, all right? So the natural question, I mean, uh, it's not a surprise to say that I will we'll make a linear approximation of this, but the question, the deeper question I want to discuss is how valid, how useful is that linear approximation for these pretty nonlinear systems, right? So, um, you know, the, we're gonna linearize by approximating this with its Taylor, first order Taylor approximation, we'll linearize about some nominal configuration, which requires having a nominal x and a nominal u. And we'll approximate those dynamics This would be, you know, in the full Taylor expansion with higher order terms, it would be exact. 
but I'm going to truncate the higher order terms and just say I'm going to approximate it with this. Okay. How do we get a system out that looks like this? Okay, so the first observation here is that um, you know, this, this you could also write as x0 dot. It's the derivative at x0, u0. So I'm going to change my variable, I'm going to change coordinates. into the error coordinates, okay? I'll call it x bar my error coordinates, which is x relative to my linearization point. u bar is u in my, in relative to my linearization point. This gives me x bar dot is x dot minus x zero dot. So if I bring this over here, then in this coordinate, if I call this big matrix A and this big matrix B, then I get a linear system in the error coordinates. There's one catch though. I'd like these coordinates to be fixed in time, okay? So really, it's a little weird to write x nominal dot, right? If, I'm, if my coordinate system is moving, it has a derivative, then we can do, we will do that actually later, but that's a little bit weird. So, No, I guess. What, what kind of assumptions are you worried about? Oh, I was worried if they had like the same basis vectors if this type of approximation would work. <clears throat> in any generalized, if these are independent um, basis vectors, then this, this is just a standard approach uh, from, from calculus. The only thing you'd get into trouble with is if you had, for instance, constraints or something like this that were, um, we're somehow forcing a relationship between x, uh, different value, variables of x, then you might have to take more care, okay? But in general, if these are independent coordinates, this should be fine. So what does this um, x dot zero equals zero constraint apply, imply? What does that imply for our ability to linearize in this way? Yeah, good. gone behind the podium for you there. X zero, U zero is a fixed point, okay? So if you try to linearize around some point of the acrobat here, then you're gonna end up with a, it's not that you can't linearize, but you're gonna have a more complicated linearization that's gonna have a moving coordinate system. If you choose a point here or here, you can imagine, in fact, there's a lot of places in the acrobat you could potentially linearize because you could have a non-zero torque. This is a potential fixed point. Any, in fact, there's a whole manifold of potential fixed points like this, okay, where a constant torque could hold the acrobat fixed. It's kind of weird to think about that, but it that's sure, certainly can work. What matters is that the center of mass of the acrobat is in line with the shoulder, okay? But there's a, there's a whole manifold of solutions that can do that. All right, good. So um, the, the big question is what, to what extent does that capture the dynamics? If I've taken a Taylor approximation, do I have any hope of this working for the nonlinear system? And I have to admit that my view on this changed dramatically. It was a while ago now, but when I first started trying to control 
you know, airplanes landing on a perch and the like. I, I was like, linear control's got nothing to do here. LQR, bah, you know, no way. This is a complicated nonlinear system. And it, it was actually the perching example that really changed my mind about that, is that where linear control in the vicinity of some complicated trajectory worked incredibly well. And I'll, I'll actually give that as, an ex as a specific case study uh, in a few lectures. So it turns out that now I believe that linear control for any reasonable sort of smooth nonlinear system, if F changes smoothly, it doesn't have huge discontinuities in it, then you'd expect this Taylor expansion to, to potentially work well. And let me try to convince you of that. Take our pendulum again. So X here is theta, theta dot, U equals tau. If I write X dot now in this coordinates, then I get the first, first term is just theta dot. And then the second term, I have to solve for theta double dot. So I get one over ML squared times the rest of it. Tau minus B theta dot minus MGL sine theta. I'm going to linearize around x0 equals, I'll do it around the top. So I'll do it pi and 0. I'd like theta to be at pi and theta dot to be 0 and u equals 0, u0 equals 0. And indeed, if you put that in, x dot is a fixed point. And if I do partial f, partial x of this at that fixed point, then someone asked about this last time and I, I appreciated the question. So this is a, a matrix, right? So it's the um, derivative of a vector f, right? With respect to another vector, so the terms there's a couple different notations out there, but I always write it like this in that order. The reason for that you'll see is that I'll be able to multiply times another vector in, in a nice way and sort of it works pretty well in the uh, matrix case, in the Jacobian case, okay? So here, partial F1, partial theta is zero. Partial F1, partial theta dot is one. Partial F2, partial theta is, I've got this thing canceling it out, it's negative G over L cosine theta, yeah. And then this one, partial F2, partial theta dot, is negative B over ML squared. And when I evaluate this now at theta equals theta naught, right? Then this cosine theta just becomes one. And just so I don't have to write quite as much, um, I'm going to set m equal to l equal to 1, okay? 
um, even I'll set b equal to zero. Seems reasonable. I can't quite get myself to set g equal to one. Let's call it 10, okay? All right, so let's simplify that to zero, one, ten, negative 10. Um, I screwed up, I've got a negative g. Should I have had a negative g? Oh, cosine, yes, cosine of pi, so this should have become, thank you, good. So that's a positive 10. Okay, and B similarly is the partial of this with respect to U here, becomes zero, and then one over ML squared, which is just one. Okay, so that's my linearization. Does it capture my dynamics? Now, in your linear differential equations class, you might have done the basic phase portraits of linear systems. The way you do that is you do the Eigen analysis. You figure out what are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that system. Okay, so, the, so I'd like to say, let's just ignore the control input for a second here and ask if torque was zero, does this matrix represent the dynamics of my pendulum, right? Does, does x dot equals ax approximately equal f of x, you know, minus, this is x bar, right? f of x zero in the vicinity of the, of that fixed point, right? So the way you do Eigen analysis in linear systems, I take my AA matrix, I wanna find its eigenvectors and eigenvalues, which are defined as the vectors for which multiplying by A is the same as multiplying by a Scalar, okay, take the determinant, a minus lambda i to be just equal to zero. You pump that through, you get lambda is plus or minus square root, of, let me actually just write it out. Lambda one, this, lambda two is negative of that, square root of 10, and the eigen, Vectors are one square root of 10. V2 is negative one square root of 10. Okay, so I can draw the phase portrait here. I have um, theta versus theta dot. This is actually in the error coordinates, if you will. Then there's two important vectors. There's one that looks like this, one that looks like this, right? This is square root of 10 is about three, so it's a slope of about three to one, okay? For systems that start on this, if I have something that's just on V, then multiplying by A just gives me a multiple of V, okay? When it's V1, my multiple is pushing me out. When, my, when I'm on this line, my multiple is pulling me in. And the cool thing about this is that I can write any X as some, since these two vectors are independent, they span the space, I can write any x as a linear combination of those, so I can write any x dot as and that allows me to fill in the details in between here 
And in practice, I get, at any point, I could draw the vector field. I get solutions that are like this. This is sort of probably something you've seen in a linear differential equations class, right? Does that look kind of familiar? It's like maybe not for a couple of years, but it's out, it's back there somewhere. Okay. So the question is, what is that? How well does that represent my pendulum? It's exceptional. It's awesome, okay? Let me just show you that if I were to draw the, if I were to overlay the pendulum dynamics on it, then this is the dynamics, these are the orbits of the pendulum. Yeah? Even this stuff seems like a pretty complicated thing, right? Of course, at some point it's wrong, right? It doesn't capture that right there, but it's pretty, it does a pretty darn good job, okay? So when do you expect that to be valid? Well, I don't know, it's pretty darn good around here. It's pretty bad over here because one of them says zero and this one says that, right? So if you get too far away from your fixed point, you're in trouble, okay? But, but actually for a pretty big swath of space, the linearization can be pretty darn good, okay? And what matters for that really is that f is continuous and doesn't change too fast, right? So as I, as I move x, if, f, if the vector field were to just to change discontinuously or something, then it might be bad, but, but here the linearization is, is pretty good and pretty useful, okay? So in practice, what we're gonna do is we're gonna call, we're gonna make that linear, linearizing approximation, we're gonna run LQR, and we're gonna get a controller that works whenever I'm close in here. Now you remember we talked about the region of attraction as a definition of, of a fixed point can have a region of attraction. So what we're gonna see to, is that if I apply the linear controller to the nonlinear system, I'll get a region of attraction that looks something like this. We'll be able to prove that, okay? That there's some set of initial conditions which, for which the linear controller works well for the nonlinear system. And the cool thing is we'll be able to certify that. We'll be able to find a rigorous inner approximation, so there might be some other states that could eventually get to the goal, but we'll be able to find a guarantee that everything inside some big region is guaranteed to get to the goal, even for the nonlinear system. Okay, so linearization can work incredibly well. And like I said, it took me time to come around to that. So, <clears throat> Let me, let me call it linear approximation locally is not feedback linearization. Those are two different ideas, right? I would say this one maybe is good. I'll use my red chalk to say the other one's, I don't know, it's bad, but it's just, this is more like destructive, you know. Um, this one I think of as trying to erase what's here and draw the linear system on it. Whereas this one's just saying, I can describe that vector field pretty well in some region by a linear approximation, okay? All right, so once I have this A and B, that locally represents my system, then I can just call LQR, right? I can just load up my software package, call linear quadratic regulator,
where Q and R were the terms in the cost function from last time, right? <clears throat> Let's take a minute though to appreciate how awesome that is because even though, I mean, this system, this linear system is not trivial um, and it, it's not actually stable, right? This was an unstable fixed point. It has two vectors that are going out here and, and certainly initial conditions of the linear system here are shooting away from the fixed point. So if I wanted to design a linear feedback that stabilizes this, for a pendulum maybe you could do it, but for a acrobat, it's not, it's not actually clear what, how, I, how I should set K and S, or just even K, okay? I mean, in general, what I'm doing is I'm looking for, you could think of it as looking for a linear feedback, right? So I have x dot equals ax plus bu. I'm trying to find u equals negative kx. How do you pick K to stabilize um, a pendulum, an acrobatic cart pull, okay? It's not super clear. In fact, I want to convince you that it's, it's, it's non-trivial. So if I were to look at this and write this as the closed loop response, A minus B K times U, right? If I just substitute this into here and write it like this, I can give you very simple examples where this where, where the set K is pretty non-trivial. Okay, let me, let me even just, I wrote one down here. So for instance, let's just say I had A's and B's such that my closed loop dynamics had K1 and K2 appearing in a, in a few places. Okay, if I took the, um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this. I'm sorry, I wrote a U there, that's an X. Okay. The eigenvalues of this are negative one plus or minus the square root of K1 and K2. So this, in this trivial example, if K1 and K2 is zero, then both of my eigenvalues are less than zero and I'm good. But if you look out a little bit and just look at the set of Ks, let me just try to make this point here. Tell me if it doesn't land here. Okay, so certainly picking K1 and K2 to be zero, that actually worked okay. But there's a critical point when K1 times K2 equals one, you know, the, where things start getting bad, where I get one of my eigenvalues of my closed loop response becomes greater than zero. So in fact, if I were to just map out the set of stabilizing controllers, okay? So these are stable and these are unstable. That is not a convex set, okay? So let me spell it out, right? So let's say I'm doing, I wanna just, pick K1 and K2 in order to find my solution, right? I, I'm gonna just forget about LQR, who needs that stuff? I'm just gonna write down a K1 and K2, tune them a little bit, try to get my controller. It's not clear that's a good idea, right? I could pick a K1, I could even find two different values of, of K that worked fine, 
but if I start going between them, I could easily go into an unstable regime, right? Nearby points, if I just, am I just tweaking K1 or K2, I might throw my acrobat across the room, right? And in fact, I, I, this is a question for, for people who, I mean, a lot of reinforcement learning approaches do search directly in the parameters of K, and it's not clear that that's a good idea. In the simple case of LQR, the theory is starting to evolve. Even just last, last year, I, you know, I, I heard a nice result saying that actually searching directly in K1 and K2 with stochastic gradient descent, as the, you can show when it will converge, that it's likely to converge with probability one, okay? But it's not, it's not obvious that searching in K1 and K2 is a good idea. Certainly for the acrobat or something, it, it's gonna be a pretty complicated function. So LQR you could think of as just a different set of knobs, right? I've got this magic function that for any Q greater than equal to zero, R greater than equal to z greater than zero, I get a stabilizing K. So it seems like a, it's a better idea Instead of searching, if you're gonna twiddle some knobs or have an algorithm twiddle some knobs, right? Maybe don't do it in K. You could do it in Q and R and stick an LQR solver in the middle. That might work better, right? Certainly if you're gonna tweak your quadrotor and you've only got one of them, right? You might be happier, you know, changing Q and R a little bit in order to change the performance instead of changing K. Right? Actually, I don't, I don't think this is the end of the story. I don't think Q and R is perfect either because we actually know that there are controllers, there are solutions K which can stabilize the system for which LQR will never produce that result. But the reverse is always valid? For any positive Q and R, I will always get a positive K, or I get a stabilizing K. But it is not the case that every stabilizing K is available by tuning Q and R. Okay, that's a subtle point, but a lot of, like a control theory's got a lot of, I think, penetrating results on these kind of things, right? And there's actually different parameterizations that exist which do exactly, there's convex parameterizations that exist which ex capture the entire family of stabilizing case. It's called the EULA parameters. That's, that's a, something I'll mention more later in the class. But I want you to appreciate that something important is happening here. That finding K is not trivial, but, it, but optimization can make it a lot better. Okay? For instance, if you start playing with the Q and R parameters, ah, I got a cramp on my hand. Um, if you take the Q, the Q and R parameters of the, even um, the pendulum, for instance, and you start moving them around, move around Q and R, then it puts like a limit. It won't let you go unstable, okay? So, Q, you know, the K matrix will converge, and I'll put, I'll put some examples up. The K matrix will, will move around. You can set it so you get arbitrarily large Ks, but you'll never get an unstable K. You can just, it's just putting rails on your solutions to, to prevent you from ever doing something really bad. It's magically good. Okay, it turns out that you, there's a general form of how do you get, um, if, if I wanna do this recipe of, of, of linearizing the equations of my manipulator equations, if you do it a bunch of times, you'll see there's, a, there's some characteristic solutions. You know, every time you write this down, you're gonna get some characteristic solutions. Since it's a second order system, this thing's always gonna be zero. There's gonna always gonna be the identity matrix here. This one's always gonna have my sort of gravity terms in it. This is always gonna have my Coriolis and, and damping terms in it. And so there's actually a crank you can turn that avoids a lot of the math for the manipulator equations to linearize them. Okay, and that's all 
written carefully in the notes, but I'll skip past it here. So linearizing the manipulator equations is a little more specialized than linearizing arbitrary systems. You can exploit their structure. Okay, so if I, let's say I linearize the acrobat. I get some A and B matrix. In fact, let's do it with code. Just a few lines of code. That's, by the way, me tweaking my trying to change Q and R in order to make my system go unstable, and I can't do it because it smashes. Even if I, if I take R and make it bigger and bigger, it still won't let me go unstable, right? So this is hitting up against the rails. Okay, but here's an example of the acrobat. Okay, so I'm going to create an acrobat. Do you understand? I haven't I haven't described it carefully yet, but what the context is, right? So there's a bunch of things that go into my equations of motion. There's x, u. As we get more advanced, we'll have parameters. We'll have disturbances. Instead of passing around x and u and sometimes parameters and sometimes disturbances, we just made a structure. It's called the context. Okay, that's all it is. Sorry, if it looks weird, uh, as soon as you realize that's what it's doing, it's just making some default parameters. The, the, the create default context just says a nominal x, a nominal u. In these systems, that's basically all it is, okay? And then I'm gonna set the state part of that to be zero pi zero zero, okay? And then I could just ask to linearize the plant around that context with that set of parameters, that set of states, that set of initial conditions, and I can plot my, um, my linear system. I get a B matrix that looks like this. Let me be a little careful. There's two B matrices flying around here. This is the one that, um, <clears throat> that I want to be careful about. So I had can rewrite this using the same thing we did in the pendulum case where we get Q dot here and then we get M inverse Q tau G Q, right? All the same stuff. And I'm gonna approximate this with A linear X bar plus B linear U bar. Okay, I'm gonna So this is the one time where I've known for a long time that there's a symbol problem and I just refuse that there's just no better solution. B is the one everybody always uses here and I refuse to change my notation and for linear systems, B is always the thing you multiply here. This B is not the same as that B. They're related, of course, all right? But this one has more stuff going on in it. So today, I'll write in this, whenever I put them next to each other, I'll just try to distinguish those. But there's a slightly different B in a linear system, okay? But if I were to like write a linear system of equations and put something other than B there, people would be like, what is he doing? You know, it just doesn't work. Okay, um, now the question is, what chance does LQR uh, have of working on this system, okay? There's an important notion that's well-defined for, for um, linear systems, which is controllability, right? Oh, 
Who knows what controllability means? A few people, yeah? So for linear systems, the definition of controllability is that I can take any initial condition and drive the system to the origin, okay? That there exists some, some input signal, u, u as a function of time, that can get me to the origin in finite time. In fact, if you give me a, a amount of time, I can generate some u that gets me there. That's the notion of controllability. The nonlinear definition is effectively the same. It's just that you have to be able to go from every in initial condition to every final condition. You, pick, you give me an x zero and an x final, I can find a, a, a trajectory that will get you there. Yeah. Yep, so effectively this is, uh, this is the same, uh, this is effectively the same definition. So th it's, it's a little bit subtle because you could have a stable system that's passively stable with no control inputs and uh, let's see, would that, yeah, that, so that would not be controllable but it would be stable. But they're, they're very similar. For, for, our, for our intensive purposes here, we have um, a controllable system is a stabilizable system, except for the, the slightly weird cases, yeah? So the question is, how does controllability relate to underactuated? I've done a linearization of my system, of an underactuated system. The B matrix I got out is clearly low rank, this is, my B matrix here, can the system be controllable? It turns out that even if my system is underactuated, I can still be controllable, right? I can still get to the origin. It just might take, I might have to take a circuitous route to get there. So control, so the acrobat linearized around the top is controllable but it is also underactuated. So those are different, distinct, very importantly distinct definitions, yeah? And there's a standard test if you know your linear systems uh, well, you'll see, you'd be happy to see that the controllability matrix uh, is, is all good and is available if, if you want uh, to play with it. Okay, yes? Yes. Right, so that's, that's uh, a, a stable system, stable stability and controllability are slightly different, right? Controllability might require an unbounded input signal, but you should drive it there in a finite time. Okay, so for the acrobat and the cart pole, if I linearize the system around the top, I find that I do get these B matrices that have a bunch of zeros in them still, but the systems are controllable, okay? And in fact, LQR works really well, okay? So, the code that generates this is just almost exactly what I just showed you. For the Acrobat, I just called LQR with Q is basically the diagonal matrix. Now I, I kicked it from large initial conditions and you can see that if it gets too far away, that's the random perturbations from the top, okay? If it gets too far from the top, it will fail. It does have a finite region of attraction, but in the vicinity of the upright, so that was too far. Okay, that was too little to be even interesting, but, but you can give it a knock and it still works, okay? Almost identical code to 
point where I, it's, it's like uh, I don't want it both to exist in the source repository because it's like copying things around, we'll stabilize the cart pool, okay? So this is, again, the random initial theta, theta dot, x, x dot, mac, uh, okay? And the same thing will stabilize the cart pool. The cool thing is it stabilizes co more complicated systems too. If I have a, for instance, a quad rotor, complicated dynamics, multiple actuators, it's still under actuated, I can stabilize that too, okay? Sorry. I'll make the notebook version of this for you to play with. Okay, here's a planar quad rotor with a cheesy animation, okay? Starting from large range of initial conditions and it basically always stabilizes just with a linear feedback on a nonlinear system. And the same thing works in 3D. Here's a little 3D visualizer. Matplotlib is not so hot at 3D visualization. Oh. It's worth it, just a second. I guess I'll look at it this way instead. Different visualizer. There we go. Okay, random initial conditions, 3D. If you go too far and your quaternion representation is poorly represented by rotation matrices and stuff, you, then it gets bad, but actually for a large range of initial conditions, it works just fine. <laughs> I blasted it, but okay. So um, we've gone to the next level of underactuated, right? We've talked about acrobats, cart pulls. We're going to do more because so far I've only given you a piece of the solution. We talked about value iteration. It's got promise. There's a challenge. The gauntlet has been thrown down, um, but it requires some extra work to make it work for the more complicated systems. Linearization, however, does not have the same foibles. You can linearize, and for any Q and R, if the system is controllable, then you can use LQR to get pretty satisfying solutions, okay? And then by tweaking Q and R, you can make it converge faster or slower, use less energy, more energy, or use more torque, less torque, for instance, like this. Okay, so these the tools together, you know, this pipeline together, gives us pretty good solutions about once we're close to the top. And next week, we'll figure out how to get from the bottom to the top and figure out the rest of state space, okay?